welcome back from lunch. I am, this workshop is not a thing. Uh, do social capital and spiritual capital matter? That's the title of our workshop. So, uh, Megan's title is a little bit different, and that's great. So, we are with this Megan Cotter. She is the executive servant leader, I love that title, of Micah Economical Ministries, which is in Maryland. Right? It's, in, it's actually in Virginia. It's in Virginia. Fredericksburg, Virginia. Fredericksburg. <laughs> uh, which serves uh, individuals experiencing homelessness uh, on the path of sustainable housing. Megan uh, has a, a graduate from Emory and Henry College in 2004 with a degree in mass communications and public policy and community services. She just recently earned her master's degree from uh, in urban studies from Eastern University. And in doing that, she uh, did a thesis looking at studying three faith-based organizations who are using relational approaches to ministry. Bridge of Hope was one of them. So some of your locations have staff or others participate in the interview process with Megan. Mm -hmm. So she is here to share with us her learnings from her research. Great. Great. Well, thank you all um, very much for having me. It's it's exciting when you've you've put together a, a really big paper to actually get to talk to people who are remotely interested in it. Um, <laughs> and if you are really interested in it, I'm going to make sure that um, Bridge of Hope has a has a, um, a copy of the final. Um, thesis and these slides um, so and I think there's a members area that you all can access that they're going to post it in so um, the thesis is already on there. it is already on there that's awesome good but I'll make sure they have these slides because um, like I said it's 151 pages and um, this is a little bit more of a condensed version <laughs> um, so um, I'm going to kind of take you through the journey to uh, give you some context of, of the, some of the conclusions that I came to in doing the research um, that I did uh, back in the spring. Um, and um, uh, a lot of that has to do with not only, you know, myself and my experience, um, you know, but also uh, what, I, um, what I have come to understand about um, both homeless services homeless people and faith-based organizations in general. Um, um, and the, the primary thing that brought me to this research is that I'm an executive director of a uh, faith-based nonprofit in Fredericksburg, Virginia. Um, I've, I've been doing that for 11 years now. Um, and um, notably, we work more with individuals, um, but um, I, um, after doing this for over a decade, I was in becoming increasingly perplexed at seeing those who had survived the unthinkable on the streets move into housing and deteriorate in ways that they never would have on the street. Um, seeing um, the same four walls that kept frequent flyers out of jail and housing um, cause new problems um, for, for folks, yet also knowing that the folks we were housing and, and supporting were also benefiting in some really interesting ways um, when we would would put them into housing. The second thing that happened to me, um, and I've spent a lot of time in the national conversation about ending homelessness, whatnot. Um, I was sitting at, in the midst of my own wrestling with this subject, I was sitting at a National Alliance conference um, and someone was using this video, I'm not going to show it to you, but when you get the slides, if you want to see it, you can. Um, the, but um, but it's an it's a image of a waterfall and basically the waterfall is a symbol of um, people falling into homelessness and the point that the workshop leader was trying to make is that agencies and organizations and communities are like buckets and if we just line the buckets up and, and make them structured in such a way that, um, that we will be able to um, to end homelessness in communities. And I was sitting there and I am as housing first as they come, I am as end homelessness as they come, and I'm sitting there watching this video and in the midst of my own struggle with the subject, I'm just sitting there going, that's not enough. Buckets aren't enough. Um, so that was a profound um, point for me. Um, and the third thing um, that, um, that I worked through was um, I spent a summer during my um, graduate work 
uh, doing a practicum trying to understand why faith-based and secular organizations often t couldn't get along when it came to um, to homeless services and wrestling through um, some of the distinctions um, and it all led me to this quote that people don't become homeless when they run out of, of money, when they run out of resources, but when they run out of relationships. Um, and um, I found that this um, was an answer to um, why people who had been homeless for years still struggled in housing. It was an answer to my that, that pull on my heart as to why um, buckets just didn't seem enough in trying to stop the waterfall of homelessness and it was oftentimes the reason that faith and secular organizations couldn't get along because the faith-based community wants to talk relationship and the secular world doesn't always get that. Um, so um, this quote then uh, led me um, on a journey um, where I began to examine um, responses to homelessness through a relational lens. Um, and in um, some of the reading I was doing, I found that most um, approaches to homelessness are oftentimes coming at, um, at the issue from three different perspectives, which I call organizational capital, institutional capital, and physical capital. Organizational capital being the systems, it's lining the buckets up. Um, and I'm sure in your own communities you've heard a lot about systems and if the system will just do. Um, institutional capital, a lot of programs try to help people improve their lives by setting up a lot of rules and regulations and, and working through some of those things. And then physical capital, we've heard a lot in recent years about if the housing is in place, if the services are in place. Um, and I found that the majority of organizations approaching this issue were coming at it um, from, the, from these three, three perspectives. And the thing that was missing was what I'm calling social and spiritual capital. Um, and they were oftentimes, even though some organizations would, would have hints of social and spiritual capital, they were oftentimes the less dominant way that, um, that they were, um, that this conversation and this work about, uh, about ending homelessness was, was, being, um, was being carried out. Um, social capital, I define as the relationships. Um, it's what you get by virtue of who you know. Um, it's your social capital, bingo, that you guys have been, been doing. Um, spiritual capital, I think, is a little bit more of a foreign word to people. Um, it's not just about relationship with God, but it's about, about connection and feeding of, of what feeds a person's soul. Um, it's about identity. It's about self-worth. Um, there's a quote that says it's the wellspring of our sense of meaning, our will to live, and the source of deep love, value, yearning, and hope, which is, can mean different things to different people. Um, and what's interesting and why I chose to talk about both of them is they're very much interrelated. Social capital is an external uh, expression and spiritual capital is an internal um, um, connection. Um, and the achievement of the internal can help with the external and the achievement of the external can help with the internal. So I, I see them as very um, inter, interrelated. Um, so as I got into the, um, into the research, um, um, it's impossible to, to build a study around um, something that you think doesn't exist without researching where it does exist. And so I set out to, um, to look at organizations that I thought were leading with that social and spiritual capital um, context um, and um, asked, um, asked questions about 
um, why they thought social and spiritual capital, the relational and the identity self-worth pieces were important, the strategies that they were using, um, and why faith was or wasn't important in their implementation, and then of course what the challenges were involved in. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna get into that, um, but to kind of help you understand um, uh, how it got to that, um, I want to talk some about the theoretical and philosophical underpinnings of that. Um, one of the things I think we grossly underestimate is that we as a country have a displacement problem and have from the very beginning of time. Um, America was founded by uh, displaced people uh, seeking a new world to, um, to, to have the kind of life that they couldn't have where they came from. Um, the com the um, America displaced other people when it uprooted Native Americans and sent them um, into disarray. Um, the um, there's there's count if you think through history there are countless examples of displacing um, people from Africa to bring them here to help um, and become slaves in the United States. In the Industrial Revolution was about people about people moving. The Great Depression was a was an example of um, of two million people um, being displaced because of economic conditions, which I think it, it just every period in our history links back to some form of displacement. The most current I think um, being um, the state of the mental health system and how many um, uh, many people who oft who may have previously been institutionalized have been brought back to communities and not provided with support and that they need in order to um, um, to, to make it so there's there's so many examples of, of displacement that have brought us um, to where we are and that's coupled with um, this idea that we also have lost this understanding of how we connect with one another, even our neighbors. Um, people, people generally um, don't um, necessarily even know their neighbors names. I know I live in, in Fredericksburg. A lot of the people who live in, in my community commute to Washington DC and they leave at 5 a.m. and they get back at, at 7, 8 o'clock at night and they go to bed and they do it all over again. So who knows their neighbors? Um, and I think the best way to, to, to break this, this down for you, and there's a lot of, um, of, um, of of books that are coming out, I think, right now about this. Everybody's favorite seems to be Bowling Alone, um, which is, talks about uh, social capital and how we used to bowl as groups and now everybody's bowling alone. And um, Brene Brown, um, if anyone's a follower of her, has a new book out that I'd recommend called Braving the Wilderness. And it's all about that we've lost this idea of how we belong even to each other. Um, you know, and I'm not even talking about homelessness in this. I'm talking about just how we, all of us, kind of go about our, our day to day. Um, and there was a really interesting story in a book called Beyond Homelessness um, that um, the author talked about um, Kenneth and Kenny. And Kenneth had lived in a high rise apartment and he had two other houses. Um, and Kenny lived under the bridge nearby. And uh, the interesting parallel that he drew is that Kenneth um, had less home associated with his housing than Kenny did, who didn't even have a house. So this housing idea is about very much more than just having having housing it's about home and and um, I have come to understand even for myself that probably all of us have a homeless story of some shape or form that's rooted in this profound catastrophic loss of, of relationship, be it spiritually, emotionally, mentally, or physically. There, are, all of us, if we really look at 
um, the, tran the transitions that people made from college. Maybe we've been through a divorce. Maybe we've been through the loss of, of a family member that was important to our sense of self and our relationship. Most people, when you go around a room, can come up with a time in their life that they felt disconnected um, and have struggled to reclaim that. And I argue that that's actually not so different than what our friends who are on the street and in our shelters are actually, um, are actually struggling with. Um, and that's, this is a little bit more about, um, about that idea of, of houselessness, you know, not just being about, um, about the, the, physical, um, the physical structure of um, having, having a place to live. Um, on the social science front, um, the reason that most of us can't figure out this connection thing, and everybody points to Maslow's hierarchy of needs as the, as the, as the way that you know, we should go about our work in social services or ministry if you, there's this, there's this idea that, you know, if you have physical, physiological needs met, then you can work on safety and you can work your way up the ladder. But if you really break it down, that's actually not how it works. Um, the reason most of us can't figure out how to, how to even deal with our own social and spiritual capital is because we are um, still thinking of our lives and others as this tiered progression of start to finish when it's actually more of a process. Um, as I think most of you would probably say about the families that you're working with, it's a process. It's not just, we're going to give you this, and then we're going to give you this, and then we're going to build and we're going to all be self-actualized. Um, there's an ebb and flow and moving in that process. Um, and if you look at that, um, if social capital speaks to that love and belonging level of um, of this scheme, and spiritual capital addresses the, um, the esteem tier, there's actually uh, some question as to whether these components are merely steps toward the end goal, or they actually support the entire process. And I would argue that there are better models, um, and if you Google alternatives to Maslow hierarchy of needs, you will be shocked at how many different variations there are. Um, and um, and the, the, the reality is, is, that that is that social and spiritual capital actually are, are pieces that are important across the whole process. They're not just components that you get to and check off your list and keep going. So one example of one of those alternatives is, um, this is a, a, a model by a guy named um, uh, Mac, Max Neef. Um, he's a, a Brazilian um, uh, sociologist. Um, and he proposed that human needs are a system um, versus any kind of hierarchy of continuum. And it actually kind of works that it, you know, we start in the center and it, it grows outward. And this, the same self-actualized idea is achieved as people grow on a continuum and fill up and fill up the whole circle. But he also acknowledges that people move in and out of this process. We can be, we can be high in the freedom area, but low in the understanding area. And that based on kind of wherever we are in our lives, and it's just this process of becoming the whole. Um, um, so, and like I said, there's a lot of other examples out there that are, are worth, um, and I've got a few others in my paper that are worth looking at as, as examples of, of maybe how you might think about the work that you're doing um, a, little bit, uh, a little bit differently. Um, and to, to throw a little bit of theology in, um, into the, the, the research aspect of this as well, um, if you look at the very root of Christian hospitality, it was all about, uh, about people opening up their homes, um, bringing the stranger into their homes and being with people in whatever, it was very messy. <laughs> and and um, there's, there are two people that I came across that, that argue, you know, 
rather than embrace the messiness, we have lost something fundamental to our needs as human beings by over-organizing um, some of this, this work. Um, Christine Pohl has a book um, about Christian hospitality that talks about that we've distanced the ways um, we've, re we've responded to strangers um, and transitioned to a world that um, we send people to social services, we send people to the church, we send people everywhere except ourselves to be a part of, of the, um, the solution. Um, and there's another um, fellow named John McKnight who actually calls it a professionalism problem that, um, that you know, we don't know, not only do we not know what we need, how to resolve it, um, but that um, an outsider must step in to help us to um, to achieve it, which is actually counter-cultural to who we are as human beings and what we need in order to um, to make um, to make um, to make different paths in our lives. So, as far as um, some of the research goes. Um, I, as I said, I looked at three organizations, um, Bridge of Hope being one of them. I don't think I have to tell anybody here what Bridge of Hope is. Um, but um, two, the two other organizations that I looked at, um, an organization called 3E Restoration, which is um, out of uh, Williamsburg, Virginia. And they are um, a similar model to, to Bridge of Hope, not the same thing, but um, I would call them a church partnership model. Um, where they train people in churches to work with folks. They work more so with individuals, not exclusively. Um, and then there's another organization that I spent some time with that's out of um, Austin, Texas, um, called Mobile Loaves and Fishes. They started out as a mobile food truck ministry, and as they learned and got to know the people that they worked with, they have now created a what's called a community first village. It's tiny homes, RVs, um, park homes, and it's very centered around this idea of building community for people. Um, a fascinating, um, fascinating um, model that. Um, um, that they've got, it's 27 acres, about 250 people live there and they're actually now expanding to 350 more, more homes as well, but it's, they're very, very profound um, in how people live there and they um, have sheltered workshops, they can work there. Um, and, and, the, and they have built this community that um, that I'm not so sure is matched in a lot of in a lot of our even our, our even our upper class neighborhoods. So, um, as far as the like, why this why social and spiritual capital are important. Um, the thing I found is that organizations that lead with social and spiritual capital, um, they they begin and they end in the same place. They, uh, they start with an understanding that, that people are homeless due to a breakdown in relationship, and they, they work on that in order to achieve all other things. Um, if you think about, um, if you, if you, if you, I think if you approach homelessness as people are homeless because they're mentally ill, people are homeless because they're unemployed, people are homeless because they are lacking in some of these ways. Um, it's a very, I think you, it's a very different conversation. I heard someone at a, a previous session talk about a lot of agencies will approach things and say, we do this. And I think organizations that lead with social and ca spiritual capital approach things more holistically and understanding that, that we can list all day long the reasons that people became homeless and we can find just as many if not more people with the same challenges that have never been homeless and the difference is relationship. So that's where I found that each of these organizations start in their work. Um, and they end, um, as far as their intended goal, in a um, in a um, in an in an equally interesting place. Um, I found that each of the organizations I talked to, um, while yes, they wanted people housed and supported and all the things that mainstream homeless services would say, these organizations were were looking for healing. 
They were looking for a lasting impact. Um, they were looking for, and they were looking for the community to to be um, to be a part of it. And um, and those were were not necessarily the same natural things that I think you would find in a lot of um, uh, mainstream services. Um, I found a number of different strategies that um, organizations using social and spiritual capital were using in order to achieve that. Um, uh, the um, all of them, I would say, met the expectation for being housing first in their work. Um, but um, somebody that I talked to in my research, I thought, put it absolutely beautifully that you can have housing without relationship, but you can't have relationship without housing. And that's where that housing happens idea came from. Um, as a um, as a piece of of understanding that um, that um, ge the general housing first conversation I think comes at this and says well you're either housing first or you're not and I think it carves out a new way of kind of talking about this this subject that that. Well, yes, we can be housing first, but we're also we're also relationship first, um, and and house and those two things are intertwined, and that's I think a piece that oftentimes generates friction in the conversation because it, there's you're not serving enough people, you're not you know we've got to move people quickly. There's uh, all those things that you all have probably heard before, and I offer that up as a piece of of understanding. There may be a third way of being able to talk about the the subject. The other thing I saw a lot of is that um, organizations that were relationship focused um, talked about it. They they had what I call conduits to relationship. They they were they were quick to figure out you need clothing for work. How can we accomplish that? You need a place to take a shower. How can we accomplish that? Um, you need a dentist. I'm going to call a person I know to take care of that for you. Um, glasses, furniture, but I mean, just the the things that relationship-focused organizations were willing to do was insurmountable. Whereas I think in organizations that lead from other approaches, while they may do some of those things, they were they're more apt to say well, we don't do that here, or we have to find another resource. Um, the, um, there was a much more of an abundant philosophy to a relationship-focused for organization. And those, those um, conduits, those different things, actually were pieces that actually helped to build and strengthen um, the relationship. Um, the other aspect um, is um, there was a focus on healthy relationships. Um, one of the organizations I talked to de um, defined that as um, every healthy relationship has to have affirmation, challenge, boundaries, and interdependence combined versus just one. Whereas I think some perspectives on more relational approaches is, well, um, a lot of um, fluffy stuff and, and you know, you're just, you know, being nice to them and that kind of thing. And it's, and I, I emphasize this in order to point out it's, it's way deeper than that. That, you know, it's not just giving them everything they want. It's challenging them and working with them to a point that, that both people are in a healthy place with that. And I definitely saw that across organizations. Um, the other is genuine friendship. The, um, there was a sense across the board in coming at it from a relational approach. Um, the people that were working with these individuals, these families, they genuinely cared, not just about the outcome that they were going to get to report at the end of the year, but that that person achieved wholeness as long as it took um, in order, to, um, in order to, to do that. Um, probably my favorite one is the normalizing aspect. Um, I heard a lot of Bridge of Hopes talk about taking the kids fishing, um, making arrangements for mom to have a night out, um, 
the um, the organization in Williamsburg sent somebody bought somebody a um, ticket on the tour bus so they could go see Colonial Williamsburg. Um, there were these different things that I think are oftentimes taken for granted when you're approaching things just from a how can I fix you perspective um, in a relational approach those normalizing pieces were actually a part of that healing process that actually helped people to achieve at much greater, greater levels um, over, over time. Um, and ultimately, um, you know, these kinds of relationships and experiences and doing things that are a little bit outside the box um, ended up being the things that allowed the people that were being helped to do what I call replacing old stories with new. A part of why people um, struggle in homelessness, of course, is that they are, they're battling an old story. And the more good things and positive experiences that these organizations could fill their bucket up with, those old stories became less dominant in, in how they informed and drove their, um, their lives. Um, I found all of the organizations to be very invitational about what they did. Um, inviting people to church, inviting people to volunteer, um, inviting them to do the hard things when they were ready. Um, invitation was a key word, I think, across the board as far as um, what some of, of these organizations were doing. And that extended very much to the spirituality aspect. All three organizations were profoundly Christian, yet um, they, they were not, a f the invitation was there for people to come to church, to have hard conversations about past church hurt, um, and making faith available to them when and if they were ready to, um, to accept it. Um, and the last strategy I'll point out um, that um, that um, I think is really cool is if um, if you're familiar with a flywheel, they're often big and and a lot of times on farm equipment or whatever, and they take a long time to get moving. And I found across the board that social and spiritual capital response was so persistent, so patient, so risk risk friendly that they were willing to tackle the flywheel whether that was in their own organization or whether that was um, in the person or the family that they were working with and a lot of times the way that plays out is it takes a long time to get the flywheel going because it's so big and bulky and it squeaks slowly but then when it gets going it gets going in an unstoppable way um, and I, I find that that is something I think that is generally unmatched in a lot of approaches that are not necessarily coming from um, a relation a relational approach and I think that has a lot to do with the fact that um, they that um, organizations that I think are most apt to lead with social and spiritual capital come from a faith-based perspective. I didn't have enough time or um, uh, to really explore this, but um, my, my personal belief and from what I heard from the organizations um, that I talked to is that, um, is that faith is a really important part of why they lead with social and spiritual capital. Um, I, most of them summed it up in um, the unique call of, of the biblical story. Um, I know Bridge of Hope uses the, the story of the Samaritan. Um, others use other examples to talk about what that call means. Uh, but there's countless stories that speak to that call and when you're called to do something, it's more than a job. It's more than, it, it's, a, it's a much bigger picture than, than, than where um, others may, may come to it. Um, the, um, they were oftentimes um, very risk friendly. Um, somebody called it wind pudding and rabbit tracks, knowing that you're going into something, you're taking a risk on somebody to help them get a job, to try something with your organization. You don't know whether it's going to work or not, but being able to jump in 
and embrace that was really important to organizations that were coming from this perspective. Um, and then um, that idea of understanding that the needs that are in front of us, um, if not for us, how will a response come about? And I think um, secular organizations and mainstream homeless services in general tend to approach the, um, the subject from um, what resources do we have and what can we do with those resources? Whereas I think a social and spiritual capital response relationship calls these organizations this, this approach to say, what needs to be done and how can I find the resources to do that? Which is the contrast between abundance and scarcity. Um, uh, but with anything, of course, there are challenges um, in, in coming to this approach, which is why I think it's actually rare that social and spiritual capital are, um, are a thing that um, folks are, um, are dealing with. Um, uh, and a lot of that, I think, boils down to um, people in our current society, um, as I mentioned, just don't connect well. They don't know how to be in relationship with each other. So how do they be in a relationship with someone with an addiction, someone with a mental health issue, someone with, um, with, with challenges that they don't even understand? Um, um, and so asking people... Um, um, to be in relationship with people um, that are moving out of homelessness, um, it just exacerbates our, our human tendencies that ranges from judging them to trying to control them to um, other temptations to fix people that um, I think Bridge of Hope does a really good job in their curriculum of trying to help people to wrestle with in themselves. Um, and, and then sometimes those in need, as I imagine some of you have, have um, experienced, can be resistant to relationship because relationship, especially churches, have, pr have probably not been friendly to them um, and they've not had good experiences. So that's a challenge when you, when you work with somebody coming out of homelessness that we have to work through what is their perspective on, um, on relationship. Um, and um, there can also be, unfortunately, um, the, um, some pretty profound conflicts between um, mainstream systems responding to homelessness and values of organizations that are coming at it from a relational perspective. A big one, I think, is I think the work of social and spiritual capital is very much one person at a time, one family at a time, um, and that's slow, and the numbers aren't as big. I'd argue the outcomes are probably better, um, but um, but there's there's a lot of emphasis in mainstream homeless services on on this many homeless and this many off the street, and there's value to that as well. Um, and I'd argue that's part of why the conversation needs to come closer together, uh, which is why I um, I suggest in my perfect world um, that that. Um, we need to begin talking more about what I call a homemaking model. Um, and that's acknowledging that the, the systems that stop the waterfall are essential and important, but so are the relationships that are going to wrap around that waterfall and be ready on the banks of the river to stick with people as long as it takes to, um, to get people where they, they need to be. Um, and that, and I, I very much think from the research and experience that I've had, faith-based communities are probably going to be the ones that are going to carry us forward with social and spiritual capital, whereas the secular world is probably going to remain inclined to work on physical um, organizational and institutional capital. And all of that's fine. What I hope for is that as this conversation goes on, that those two things can begin to understand each other and work closer together because I think we need each other um, in that um, conversation. Um, so to kind of sum up um, what, I've, what I've shared with you, um, I think the culminating conclusion is that 
um, not government, not nonprofits, not housing, or any number of other structured responses um, that anybody can come up with is ever going to be enough um, to, to truly end homelessness. And, and I've said that to a number of folks that I work with and um, who I love dearly in mainstream homeless services that if we really believe in ending homelessness, we have to talk about the relationships, the social and spiritual capital um, as well. Um, and um, that community must be built around uh, even the best, uh, the best systems. Systems are only as good as the communities that are, are built up um, are built up around them, um, and that all of us have to uh, learn how to connect with our neighbors, how to connect with the person we're passing by on the street. We all have to reconcile our disconnection and displacement problem if we're ever going to really understand homelessness and how to help our brothers and sisters on the street to overcome um, overcome that and ultimately that we, our lives and our homes, um, must become a part of that, a part of that response. So, and there's some of the books I referenced if you want.